Katie Adams here for the Treadle Pioneers Museum. We've kicked off our 2020 virtual brown bag storytelling series, and I'm back bringing you another gem from our previously recorded talks at the museum. This week, we have Crawford family descendant Jim Crawford telling us more about his great-grandfather, James H. Crawford. James H. Crawford is credited as the founder of Steamboat Springs, but in this talk, you'll learn a little bit more about Crawford's background in Missouri and what compelled him to come out west. Told not only by a family member, but also a noted his historian himself, uh, Jim has spent hours of his own time researching the Crawford family, as well as several other Steamboat Springs related topics. He's compiled booklets and a um, in-depth and helpful website called Crawford's of SteamboatSprings.com. Jim is also the owner of the Crawford Stone House located on Crawford Avenue here in town. So I hope you enjoy his talk recorded in 2011. Also remember that our website, treadofpioneers.org, is where you can find additional resources, links, uh, information about town founding and more. Plus you can find information on our outdoor summer programming, tours and event lineups. Thanks. Fourth of July. The Spangled Banner, long may it wave over a united, a free, and a happy people. The times look squally. Our political sky is covered with almost impenetrable darkness. The hopes, the sanguine hopes of the leaders of the one great Democratic Party are utterly blasted. That party are split of vivid asunder. Their once proud flag is trailing a bell who is a regional candidate in Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia. Anyway, you see, first of all, that even 151 years ago, they were celebrating the 4th of July just like we do now with barbecue picnics. <laughs> Second, he was, you can tell that he was quite passionate about his, his politics in this country. Obviously, because that was the election that Abraham Lincoln won. Uh, come the next year, he was inaugurated, and shortly after, thereafter, the, the South succeeded and the Civil War started. The following year, in the beginning of 1862, uh, Jimmy signed up for the Union Army. Well, this is not his hat, but I figured since we're talking about the Civil War, I should be a chance to wear it. <laughs> Later in life, Jimmy uh, t talked about this event of his sign signing up for the Army. And I'm going to read what he had to say. I remember the first time I was called Mr. Crawford. It was the day I was mustered in, February 10th, 1862. I didn't tell my folks till after I had joined up. The enlisting officer had known me all my life and didn't even ask me my age. He just wrote down 18. <laughs> Actually, I was 16. It would not be 17 till March 30th, but I was large for my age. I put on the blue uniform right away and the new soldier cap. Rolled up my good old homespun clothes mother had made me, tied them behind the saddle, and raced for home. <laughs> well, he was not only large for his age, but he was also mature for his age. Because two months later, uh, he was given a certificate here and promoted to be second sergeant. And uh, four months after that, he was given another certificate. These are actually copies of the certificate. But another certificate where he was promoted to be first lieutenant. So here at the age of 17, he wasn't even legally supposed to be a member of the army. He was first lieutenant, which is the second in command in a company, only behind the, the captain. Just to give you a, an idea of you know, what the importance of a first lieutenant was, I looked up the pay scale uh, in the army during the Civil War. Privates got $13 a month. Uh, for their pay. Second sergeants got $17 a month. First lieutenants got $70, almost five times the amount of a private. Captains uh, just got $80 a month, so a little bit more than first lieutenants. In addition, first lieutenants and captains got $36 a month to pay for extra rations and food. They got $16 a month to pay for the food for two horses, and they got $24.50 a month to uh, hire a, an orderly, you know, a, a private to work for their, as their servant. So it's quite a step up from private to first lieutenant. Uh, 
he had some other comments later in life about uh, about those, this first year in the Army. He said, I belong to Company E, 7th Missouri Cavalry. My first battle was at Newtonia, Newton County, Missouri. We were defending a strategic point. Since the captain was sick, I was in charge of about 100 men. I drew my sword and led the men. Someone wrote to my parents about it. Pa said, I might have known it. <laughs> As first lieutenant, I was ordered to go on a scout and was allowed to choose my men. We crossed the river and went about five miles and could hear the heavy artillery coming over the rocks. We were confronting about 5,000 rebels. I told one of my men who had the good big voice to halt them. He called, Halt! The enemy began to shoot. Two of our horses were shot and the men took to the brush. We fell back behind an embankment, but the army turned the artillery on us and we had to fall back further still. The town was in the hands of the enemy. I ordered my men to pull their revolvers and hold them at their sides. We had to go through that town. The rebels were so busy pilfering, they didn't notice us as we rode through. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's the only, only thing we have about his real battle uh, experience in the war. You know, he probably had hundreds of stories that he could tell. Uh, but we do know that he certainly participated in a lot of fighting and combat. Uh, one way we have of knowing that, there's a, a book here called When and Where We Met Each Other. Battles, Actions, and Skirmishes, 1861 and 1866. This is a compilation of all the encounters that happened during the Civil War. Skirmishes, battles, and engagements, uh, scouting operations, the whole works. And it's sorted by state and by uh, town. So this is his copy. He's signed the top here, James H. Crawford. In the first page he says, See, Arkansas, Missouri, and Kansas, J.H.C. <laughs> so you, you go through here and you, you look at the Missouri, Arkansas, and Kansas, and in the margins, he has little check marks for each of the encounters that he was a part of. And you go through here, page after page, and there's 50, 60, 70 engagements that he was, took a part in. A lot of those were scouting engagements, uh, skirmishes, uh, but certainly some of them were, were major battles. There was at least three major battles that he participated in where you know, they had thousands of soldiers on either side, would be multiple days, hundreds of casualties. They weren't quite the, the same level as Gettysburg or Bull Run or the, the big battles back east, but certainly there was shooting and, and danger to it. He only wrote uh, in the margin three times. Once he indicated that one of his friends was wounded in the battle, uh, once he indicated that his captain was, was buried at that uh, place, which I think was his way of saying that his captain was killed. And the third time he wrote uh, that he was in charge of, of the company at that, in that skirmish. <coughs> so we have one other, well a couple other sources of, of what his participation was like in the, the war. We have one letter that his father, uh, Johnny Crawford, wrote uh, he wrote it on July, uh, February 15th, 1863. I've got the letter here. It's, uh, again, I'll have it up here for people to, to see if you want. The letter was written to his, to John Edwards' uh, sister, who was also living in Missouri. He, he, the, the whole Crawford clan, you know, about five or six brothers and sisters, moved out from Kentucky to, uh, to Missouri after their father had died in Kentucky. They lived, they settled on in farmland in Cooper County, which is uh, just south of Boonesville, which is in the center of the state. So he's writing, he was the only one that then left that county. He <coughs> married there, uh, had a couple of kids, his wife died. He went looking for a, a second wife, found uh, her, Sereta Jane Donahue, over near Sedalia, which is about 30, 40 miles west of Cooper County. So he, he moved over to, you know, bought a new farmland over there, and, that's where the rest of their children were born, including Jimmy. Uh, so he's writing back to his sister over in Boonville. Again, I won't read all of it, but here's part of it. Today evening, received a letter from Jimmy, together with his likeness. He says he is in first-rate health and has been ever since he left Boonville. He was some four months since promoted to the first lieutenancy in his company. He says in one of his letters, he doesn't know how or why it was, whether it was sincere or, or otherwise, but Uncle Bill E. Reed manifested more friendship for him while in Boonville than all the rest of the kin put together. 
Uh, Uncle Billy Reed was the husband of the sister he's writing to. He would like to see Uncle Billy and tell him that his morals have not been corrupted by his soldier life, <laughs> that he has maintained his integrity and has met the rebels on equal ground face to face, and has dyed his saber in their blood, and he is determined to try to come through this war, if he comes through at all, as an honest man and a soldier. I've given you his language nearly verbatim, and would like to send you the letter and likeness, but his mother not, cannot smear them. Now I must talk to Sister Peggy a while. I know we were once fast friends, and I think we, were, we are yet. At any rate, I address you as a friend and dearly beloved sister. If I say anything that seems harsh or reproving or exacting, know that you will excuse me, and tell that it is drawn forth from an unbounded confidence in you, and not intended to rasp or wound your feelings. Well, when Hetty and I were down last summer, we concluded we were not as cordially received by many of our old friends as we should have been, if we joined in abusing our government. And more, I had a boy, a noble youth who had volunteered in the cause of his bleeding country, stationed at Boonville, sick, far away from his parents, right in the midst of his father's kinfolk. Not one of them so much as went down near to see if he was dead or alive. When I went down and found him able to ride, I took him with me to his only blood uncle's. His good uncle met us at the gate and told him he did not like to have him come there in that garb. What garb? By the union of the true soldiers of our common country, the defenders of the flag under whose ample folds we have all been protected all our lives, and that still protect us unless we have been proven ourselves tra traitors. And he goes on and on. But you know, that shows you how Missouri was definitely a border state, and you had brother against brother fighting in the, the Civil War. So I don't know if his brothers were, you know, Confederates, but they certainly did not want to have be associated with the Union Army. Now he mentioned in that letter receiving a letter from Jimmy with his likeness. We have four photographs of of Jimmy in his Civil War outfit, uh, which and I'll pass these around here. This is a tin type. Uh, he's in. He's probably this. <coughs> Probably a sergeant in this picture. He's got a cap on. Here, in this frame, frame, we have two pictures of him in the top and the bottom. The top picture here looks like it was probably taken the same day as the tin type, but without the hat. The bottom picture was probably taken uh, later, probably in the last year of the war. Uh, he looks, you know, much more clean cut and older. And we have another picture of him, which was probably taken down in the same setting. Again, this was probably taken shortly before his, his wedding. Um, you can see he was, you know, he's quite handsome and he's got a better cap than I have on here. <laughs> four years younger than Jimmy, so she was born in 1849, uh, which meant when the war broke out, she was only 13. We have a tin type, which I think was probably taken that first year. You can see how young she looks in the tin type. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the companion to that tin type. And this picture was probably taken uh, at the end of the war. And it's my guess is it's their wedding photograph. Uh, that's her wedding outfit. So in, uh, in 1873, he started doing what all soldiers end up doing. They write letters back to their sweethearts. So he, uh, he started writing letters, and fortunately we have 17 of those letters still exist. I brought two of them with me here. Uh, you know, again, you can take a look at them afterwards. I also, a number of years ago, took these 17 letters and uh, wrote them down and made a little booklet which has the text of all the letters. And this booklet is sold out in a bookstore, I think, so you can take it and read them if you want. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of parts of a couple of the letters 
the two letters that I have here. He first started writing to her in, in 1863, so he'd been a soldier for a year. Uh, during the wintertime, the, the fighting didn't really occur in Missouri, so the, the soldiers were dispersed and allowed to go back home and you know for two or three weeks at a time. So you know, he had probably just seen her during that winter and taken up a more of a friendship. They'd known each other all their life, obviously, uh, being neighbors like that. And I know later in life she used to s t tell how whenever she went to school, she could tell that he had already gone before her because she recognized the, his bare uh, footprints in the, the dusty road. <laughs> so here's his first letter. He addresses it, my dear friend. Uh, May 18th, 1863. Everything seems dull today. I've been scouting and for several days and nights and consequently have been sleeping most of the morning. While asleep, my dreams flitted back to my old home where, where in sunny youth I sported and played so often, never thinking that I would be torn from home and friends so dear. But alas, this war came up in the happiest days of my boyhood. And thinking my duty, I enlisted in the service. Never dreamed that I would be separated from the, those I love. But fate has decreed it so, and I shall cheerfully do my duty and hope for a brighter day. And war will be no more, and sweet peace reigns throughout our land. And then he talks some about you know, how he's written, and why hasn't she written back, and so on. <laughs> and that's actually the, the tone of most of his letters is is you know, they're sort of love letters, but they're also, you know, I miss you. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the letters you've received. Uh, I've received from you. Please write more often. If you only knew how happy they've made me. You know, you'd write every day, you know, on and on. And it's sort of a repetition. But occasionally he does, you know, mention his experiences in the war. Never fighting. You know, he obviously never wanted to upset her. Uh, the first three or four letters are addressed to my dear friend, or eventually he starts saying Maggie or Margaret. Uh, then there's a break uh, of about six to eight months. Again, it's the winter time, and he's come back home and seen her. And, Obviously, their relationship has heated up a little bit. So now, uh, the second letter here was written on April 8th, 1864. Uh, and I'll read parts of it. He now addresses her as mine alone. And he also now calls her Emmy. Her full name was Margaret Emmerine Bourne. So Emmy was uh, short for her Emmerine. Uh, and it's the only time he ever called her Emmy. Later in life, he, he would call her Maggie or... Margaret, or, uh, but, but during the war, during, on, in these letters, he called her an Emmy. Okay, so mine alone. Yesterday morning I was in, at Warrensburg. I felt sad and dejected, for I had not heard from my, desert, from my dearest. I was up very early to get on the march so as to make it through. I felt like I could not go further away from you, and not know whether you were well or not. And again, I thought of my duty. I mounted my horse, formed my men, and with our banner moving in the morning breeze and cheers for the Union, we passed through town. But it did not feel right, so I sent a man back to the office to inquire for mail. And sure enough, he came back with two sweet letters from you. I stopped and read them in those dear words of love. And then he talks about the letters for a little bit. Uh, and then later he says, It has been raining all day, and it's pouring down yet, and it is now nine o'clock at night. You ought to see how nice I am fixed in my tent here. I have a nice floor, a little writing table and desk, and an armchair. There's my little narrow bedstead, as neat as you please. You ought to see me sitting here with my table chair close to my little stove, reading, writing, or singing away like a schoolboy. I'm all alone since Lieutenant Lowe has gone. I'm glad I did not have to be on, out on the scout tonight. It is so cold and rainy. I can do just as well in my tent as I could in the house. So. You know, obviously that, that tent and his furniture was back at the headquarters <coughs> encampment. And they, when they actually went and traveled elsewhere, he didn't have that kind of setup. Uh, but you can tell what the, the privilege of rank does for you. <laughs> <laughs> Including having the, somebody to go back to fetch your mail for you. <laughs> okay, I, I forgot uh, with, those, with the photographs. I was going to show you... Uh, that we have some buttons from his uniform. There's, you know, I've got two large buttons and a couple of smaller buttons here, which again, I, because they're so small, I, I don't think I'll pass them around, but 
they'll be up on the table here. And there's also a, a Civil War medal. Uh, this is one which they gave, which some organization gave to all the veterans after the war. But it's obviously it's been well worn by by young people. So I'll leave these up up here on the table also. Okay, so you know he wrote those letters clear up until the last letter was three weeks before uh, the war ended, and he was mustered out in uh, in St. Louis in uh, what was the date? Mustered out April fourteenth, eighteen sixty-five. Well, he was in St. Louis. He immediately went out. Bought a ring, bought a, a new suit, went back to Sedalia, and three weeks later, he and Margaret got married. So that was sort of the the end of his his military career. And now would be a good time to reflect back on what exactly the Civil War meant to James to Jimmy. First of all, uh, it was his coming of age. He entered the, the Civil War as a lad of sixteen. He Part of the war, uh, a man of 20, uh, soon to have a wife and family. Uh, second, it was his education. He, he had a grade school education. He never went to high school. Uh, this, the Civil War provided him with a, a different kind of education. It taught him how to, to handle horses, to take care of them, feed them, to ride them. He learned how to ride fast, ride at night, uh, to ride in the midst of battle where you got gunfire and commotion and you know, where it's, it's difficult to stay on a horse. Uh, so he learned, you know, horsemanship. Uh, he learned how to, you know, to camp out, to sleep on the hard ground, to, uh, to cook his own meals, uh, to, to spend several days perhaps without much food, you know, to, to go hungry while you're doing your work. Uh, and then finally, it, it, it told him how to deal with, with men, with other men. Uh, obviously, he he became a had a leader a, a position of leadership. Uh, the company would have a hundred men. He would would often be split out on a scouting party where he might have a half dozen men uh, under his command going on a particular scout. Or at times we've seen that he was actually in control. The captain wasn't there, and he was in control of the whole hundred men. So he learned how to deal with them, even though he was probably one of the youngest uh, people in his his uh, company. He learned how to, you know, to, to deal with people, to, to be a leader of, of men. And that's something that, which, you know, he definitely was, was all of his life. He was definitely the leader of, of whatever he did. He never followed anything. You know, I, I was trying to think of some instance in his life where he followed other people, and it just isn't there. He was the one that, he didn't care what other people thought. He would, he, you know, took his wagon and his family out to the wilderness. Uh, he went where he wanted, not where other people wanted him to be. He was the one that, you know, uh, that that the founding of the town, that the community here, that uh, the, the incorporation of the town, the whole work. That his whole life, he was the leader, not a follower. And I think that was very apparent from the Civil War. And the final thing that the Civil War did for him was it uh, gave him a bankroll. You know, he, he was making $70 a month as a first lieutenant. I add that up, that comes out to over $2,000 uh, over the course of the Civil War. And he probably had most of that $2,000 at the end of it, you know, minus a wedding ring and a, a suit. <laughs> <laughs> so and shortly after he, he was married, he bought, uh, he used $1,500 of that to buy a, a farm. Uh, he ended up buying the a, land right adjacent to his father's farm and his wife's father's farm. So he had the John Crawford farm, the John Bourne farm, and the James Harvey Crawford farm, right, all together. Uh, so, you know, the, the Civil War provided him with money to, to do that. When he finally, he was a farmer there for seven years. Uh, the three the oldest kids were born on the farm. And then when he finally decided it was time to pull up stakes and move west. He sold his farm, got his $1,500 back, and he used that to bankroll his pioneering days. You know, he used that to buy the wagon and supplies. He used that to buy the horse, the cows that he uh, bought here in, in Colorado that he ended up raising, and that eventually provided him with the money uh, 
for the rest of his life. But so the Civil War was really, you know, bankrolled him. It was uh, important that he got that start. I've got uh, two more things about the Civil War before we move on. In 1899, the Treasury Department sent him a letter saying that uh, the War Department had performed an audit of various things, and they had determined that uh, they had shortchanged Jimmy. Wow. That there were six wow. or seven items where, for whatever reason, they had failed to pay him the right amount. Uh, one of the one of the one item was forty cent for <laughs> pay for use and risk of force short paid to June thirtieth, eighteen sixty two. The largest item was thirty five dollars and nineteen cents for pay and allowance April eleventh to seventeenth, eighteen sixty five. So you know, for various reasons, they had short changed him a day here, a day there. And the total came out to be $69.33. So he received that check. Then, uh, in 1928, on um, July 7, 1928, he received another letter from the United States of America Bureau of Pensions. The, the government had finally decided that it was time to give a pension to the Civil War veteran. So this letter stated that as of April 27, 1928, he was given $72 a month uh, as a pension for the rest of his life. And unfortunately, he only lived a couple years longer. But when he died, the pension then went to his, his widow, Margaret. And she lived another nine years to 1939. And believe me, this, that was the Depression years in the 30s. And this was her only source of income, the, the pension that he was due. And it, uh, she lived throughout that time in the stone house up here on Crawford Ave. Without this pen, the money from this pension, she probably would have had to sell the house and you know, move in with her daughter in Denver. So that, you know, that was the final uh, nice uh, consequence of the Civil War. Okay, we're done with the Civil War. <laughs> now on the pioneer days. Uh, as I said, he, he worked as a farmer for seven more years in, in uh, Sedalia. Then he got restless. You know, his father had been a pioneer uh, from Kentucky out to Missouri. His grandfather had gone from Pennsylvania to, to the frontiers of Kentucky. His great-grandfather had gone from Scotland to the frontier of, of Pennsylvania. So the Crawford, it was in his blood, the, you know, the head to the frontier. And the new frontier for, at that time was Colorado. So in 1872, he took a, a little trip out to Colorado. He, uh, took it by train to Denver. I think he was with one of his brothers and one of his friends. And he met up with uh, a former territorial governor of Colorado uh, who had, had used to live in the Sedalia area. And they went around to the various mining concerns of the, the governor. Uh, so they went up to you know, the front range to <coughs> the mines empire and whatnot. Uh, then he, he sent one letter back to Margaret, which uh, is a, he sent it from Greeley, Colorado. It's on the Greeley House Stationery. <laughs> so uh, this letter was addressed to Margaret, my dear girl, uh, dated August 2nd, 1872. And I'm not going to read the letter. Basically, it just says, uh, I've had a good time out here. Uh, Colorado looks great. Uh, I'm going to meet, you know, the boys back in Denver, and then we'll head on back home. So I'll see you in, you know, a little bit, but uh, I'm enjoying the trip. So he came back, and sure enough, uh, over the next year, he sold his farm, uh, made his plans, and the following year, uh, in May of 1873, the Crawfords loaded up their wagon and went on a wagon train across Kansas to Denver. Uh, and that was their third, uh, their third child, John Crawford, had just been born in February of 1873. So he was only three months old when they <coughs> got on the covered wagon. Uh, John was actually was our grandfather, uh, by the way. So uh, this the story of their pioneering trip out out to Steamboat has been told many times. Uh, the best telling of it is. The Shining Mountains, which is a, a book that Lolita Crawford Pritchett wrote. Lolita Crawford Pritchett was uh, one of their grandchildren. 
Uh, it's a, this book is a fiction book, so, so it has a lot of plot lines that are not real. But it, it's a good flavor for what the life was like uh, going by wagon train with three kids, uh, not knowing what's, what's going to happen. And it, it gives the, the overall detail of the trip is, is pretty well portrayed here. In particular, there's uh, two things in that book that, <coughs> which are sort of interesting parts. Uh, <coughs> first part is, she talks about how, well, the, they spent the first year actually in the front range. He, he tried his hand at mining in Empire. Uh, and he also, he did take one trip by himself over to Meadow Park, uh, got as far as Hot Sulphur Springs. Uh, but there was no roads for wagons, so he couldn't take his fam family over into Middle Park. So they ended up staying in, in the Denver area for, uh, over the first winter. And then the second year, uh, a road was, had finally was being built over Rollins Pass, over to Middle Park. And so they were gonna take their wagon and go on that road over. So, but before they went, Marta decided that, uh, took the three kids back to Denver, and she wanted to, have photographs taken of the kids. And that, this is all, you know, part of the story there. She got tintypes taken of the kids because she wanted to send the photographs back to her parents because she was afraid they would just cross the divide and disappear and never be <laughs> uh, So she wanted her parents to have copies. So I've got the actual tintypes here. Uh, that's Logan, the, the older son, Lily, and then John, who's our grandfather. And John obviously was, could not stand still. He had to take uh, three pictures of him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll pass these around for you. So that was, you know, part of the story that in the book. Another part was one of the treats for the kids was when Margaret made uh, muffins for her breakfast, and this is the muffin tin that she used. This kid came from Sedalia on the wagon train across to Denver and then on over to Hot Silver Springs and finally Steamboat. And you see this each uh, each muffin is in the shape of a fruit or. <laughs> Okay, so uh, again, the story is told in, the, in that book. That's fiction, so you, you do have to be careful what's real and what's not real. But Lulita Crawford Pritchard also wrote this, Maggie by My Side. This is basically the nonfiction version of uh, the other story. So if, when you read this, you know that everything in this uh, is for real. And this really tells the story much better than I can tell it. There's all sorts of interesting parts to it. Uh, they ended up spent that first winter uh, near Denver. The second winter they went over to Hot Sulphur Springs and, well, in 1874 they went to Hot Sulphur Springs, but built the first cabin there, uh, the first permanent cabin. And then while the family was living there, Jimmy went with some of his uh, Missouri buddies and they went on a scouting expedition, came out here to the, the Yampa Valley, went across 20 Mile Park, hit the river by Hayden, went down to Cray, decided that that was, was pretty good farm land and ranch land, and decided that was where he would come. They started going back, everybody else went back, uh, ripped off some bark from the tree, from a tree by the steamboat spring, and rolled up there. I claim 160 acres around this tree for my, uh, my homestead. So he went back to Hot Silver Springs, uh, you know, it was, it was very hard for them to go along the river. That's why everybody had gone to 20 Mile Park. So he couldn't really bring his family back yet because they had to come by a wagon. You know, they still had the baby and, and the kids. And uh, it, it was just too rough a trail to bring a wagon here. So, but he did come back once that, that year with one of his friends, make, made sure that nobody had, uh, had heard his, his claim. They started building a cabin. Their ca first cabin was down on 12th Street. 
the second house in on 12th Street is an ag architectural firm right now. But if you notice, that building is not parallel or perpendicular to the street like all other houses are. That house is at an angle, it's about a 30 degree angle. And that angle is right at the same angle that the cabin was built, in, built on. And so that, if, when you look at that house, you, you should envision the, the cabin being right there. So he came back you know, with a friend and built that up a little bit more each time that he, he came. Uh, but anyway, they spent the winter in Hot Sulphur Springs. He had cattle at that point, which he, uh, he kept along the river uh, near where Kremlin is, is right now. So he, was, he spent his time there in Kremlin. Every Sunday he would take but milk and butter back with him 20 miles to Hot Sulphur Springs for his family. Meanwhile, there are families in the area or other houses. You might have been the only family, but there she was with three kids, sick with heart scarlet fever. Near Stockton was you know, a good two weeks away in Denver over snowy passes. Uh, so she had to put up, all through, put up a lot through that winter. Why were they separating Kremlin and the Kremlin? Okay, uh, so that was 1874. 1870, 1875 came along. He took several trips back to the steamboat uh, with various friends. He was worried about uh, claim jumpers. Uh, every time he came back, they would open up the, the trail a little bit more, you know, make it so that it was easier to go at once. Uh, then finally in August, he brought the family uh, along. It was. The, the trail was built up enough that he could bring the family on a, not a full-fledged uh, wagon, but at least a cart that, that, brought, that they got through. So the, the family, which included his brother and his brother's wife from Sedalia, who was visiting them, came out to the steamboat in August of uh, 75. That was the first time anybody in the family other than himself had, had been here. And he, they treated it like a picnic. Uh, they stayed here a week or two, had a great time. They took baths in the, the hot springs. Uh, you know, did lots of things that uh, kids would like to do here. Uh, but it just wasn't time yet to move here permanently, and that was for several reasons. First, uh, it was late in the year. Uh, they would have had to go back to Hot Silver Springs and come with a heavy wagon with all their belongings. Plus, they would have had to go back to Denver and get supplies for the winter. <coughs> uh, and that, they just couldn't do that. Plus, their cabin really wasn't winterproof yet. Uh, it, it needed more improvements before they could do. The final reason that they, they couldn't stay here is they didn't own the land yet. Uh, he had, he had inquired in Denver about uh, buying the land here. He had staked his claim, but when he went back to Denver to the office, they said, we can't sell you the land yet because it hasn't been surveyed and we don't know, know what land it is that uh, you'll be buying. So before the government would sell the land, they always required a survey of, of the land. But they did make the provision that an individual could pay for the survey and hire a, a surveyor and do that all himself. And uh, as long as it was a certified surveyor, the government would then allow that and would, could then start processing the paper, paperwork for homesteads. So uh, James got, he came up with uh, roughly $1,000 that was needed uh, to, to hire a surveyor. And he did that by getting four other people to, to join him in this venture. The government had also said, whatever money you pay for the surveyor, we would then use as a down payment for when you actually buy your homestead. And the government was selling land at that time for a dollar and a quarter per acre. And the homestead was $160, so it comes out to be $200. <coughs> Jimmy came along with them. Oh, he wasn't on the crew. He, uh, he hunted for them, provided them with food, and made sure that they had a campsite every night. And during that three weeks time, they actually, there was snow here. Uh, and that's one reason why Jimmy was, was helping them out, because he really was, was worried that snow would come and they would have to abandon the, the survey until the following year, which would just put him back all much further. But anyway, the survey finished. 
Uh, I should mention when the, the Crawfords came here for the picnic and went back uh, to Hot Silver Springs, Jimmy's brother, John, and his wife went back to Sedalia. And he figured that was a good time for Margaret and the kids to also go with John back to Sedalia and, and spend the, you know, see her parents again. So they were back in, in Sedalia at that point. Jimmy, after the survey, went back to Denver, filled out the paperwork and whatnot. Uh, then he went back and kept his cattle again in Cramway. So he spent the winter there. The family was back in Sedalia. Then in the spring of 76, he returned to Sedalia to pick up his family. And fortunately, he said he was very glad that when he got there, they still wanted to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Margaret did say later in life, when she is reminiscing, that she would have been perfectly happy to sp spend her life on the farm in Sedalia. <laughs> yeah. she, had, she, she was a good life back there, you know, with, with her family and uh, friends. And, she didn't have that pioneering spirit, but she she was gung ho and, and supported her her husband all throughout his life. Uh, so anyway, when he when he came back, they were certainly willing to, to go back uh, with him. And this, I'm going to read a curious little letter that uh, was written April 22, 1876, uh, in Sedalia. It says, Sedalia, the Bethlehem Baptist Church, Pettis County, Missouri. Greeting. Dear Brethren, this certifies that Brother James H. Crawford and Sister Margaret E. Crawford are members with us in good, in good standing and full fellowship. At their own request, they are hereby dismissed from us. <laughs> By order of the church at our April meeting in 1876. So I think that this little letter shows, uh, I think it showed to their friends and relatives and also to themselves they were moving to Steamboat permanently. Oh, yeah. You know, when they had that three years earlier, they still kept their membership in the church. Uh, but here they were, uh, they were going to go to Steamboat wherever. That was going to be their new home. So they got on the train, went out to Denver, got on the wagon over to Hot Silver Springs, got all their belongings together, loaded up their heavy wagon, finally arrived here in Steamboat uh, in May of 1876. Uh, at that point, they had actually two cabins here. The cabin, their claim cabin that they had been working on. There was also another little cabin, which the previous year, Jimmy had hired two of his Missouri friends to come here to basically just keep watch over his, his claim. He was very worried about claim jumpers. And so he had his two friends uh, living here during that summer just to make sure that if anybody passed through, they know would know that that was Crawford's claim. So those two friends had built their, themselves a little cabin. The little cabin was uh, located where Oak Street runs between 11th Street and 12th Street. And you, you know, it's, now there's a big, big bluff on the north side of, of Oak Street. Well, initially that bluff extended out and came down much closer to the river. And their little plant cabin was right up on top of that bluff. So when they finally put Oak Street in, which was I don't know, but in the 40s or 50s, they just cut that, that all that dirt out and obliterated all, all uh, notice of that cabin. Anyway, that's that was called the little cabin. The other cabin was called the big cabin. When the Crawfords arrived here in May. The big cabin was occupied by an Indian trader, <laughs> and uh, the pioneer etiquette at that time was, if anybody was out. Uh, roaming around and discovered an empty cabin, it was okay for them to move into the cabin and you know, use it for their purposes, as long as when they left, they washed the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> so when the Crawfords came here, they found the Indian trader there, and they, they did not feel right to kick him out. So they went and went to the little cabin, and they moved in, into the little cabin. Uh, they were there about you know, two weeks. Uh, after that time, the, the Indian trader find the Indians were in the camp here at, at that time. And, but after a couple of weeks, the Indian trader had run through the course of his business here, decided it was time for him to move on and find some other Indians to trade with. So he moved off, and the Crawfords moved into the big cabin. Okay, sometime in the, the next month, uh, uh, the Crawfords received a package 
And that was sent by Perry Burgess and William Wellington, two of the people that had gone in with him on the, uh, on the survey. It had been mailed, it had come to the, on the train to Rollin, came down to Hans Peak, and somebody from Hans Peak had uh, brought down the steamboat. Inside that package was uh, an American flag. And that flag was used in the, the first Fourth of July celebration here. Uh, it's such a, a nice story that I'm going to read you what, uh, read you the story. The story was first in history printed in the Steamboat Pilot. It was, here's a copy of the issue that it was printed in. And I love the, the red uh, print the ink that they used here. Anyway, this issue was July 4th, uh, 1917. And that's the, the version I'm going to read. But there are later versions. The leader Crawford Pritchett uh, ended up writing a version which was, I don't have it here. She wrote, printed it in her book, uh, Crawford Pioneer Tales. And then just recently, just this past year, it was, uh, her version was also printed in the book about the life and times of Perry Burgess. Anyway, the, the story speaks for itself. Just think of it. Exactly 100 years intervened between the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the date of Steamboat Springs' first anniversary observance of the event that marked the beginning of a great nation. The first Fourth of July celebration held in Steamboat Springs was in 1876. The first Star Spangled Banner to wave here was in June of the same year. Well, I might mention this. This was probably written by Charles Leckenby, who was the editor of the Steamboat Pilot then. So Missouri friends of Mr. and Mrs. James H. Crawford had sent them a very handsome 8 by 15 foot bunting United States flag. No doubt they thought and hoped that somehow it, it would be a protection to them in the wilderness. As the 4th of July approached, Mr. and Mrs. Crawford decided that there should be a real flag raising. There were two or three white men then in the region. Mike Farley had squatted on a claim about where the Augusta Ranch now is. Charles and Owen Harrison about where Sydney is located. Mr. Crawford planted a handsome pine flagpole across the street from the present cabin hotel. A large number of Indians were camped in the vicinity, some along the bottom below the present depot, and perhaps a hundred or more along the mesa where Mr. Crawford's residence now stands, up on Crawford Avenue. The Redskins were notified that a flag was to be raised and were invited and requested to attend. Indian-like, their curiosity and suspicions were keenly appointed, no, were keenly aroused. Nearly all were on hand long before the hour set for the exercises. When the point of time came, Mr. and Mrs. Crawford and their three children, Lulu, Logan, and John, get, together with the white men named above, proceeded down the hill from the cabin to the flagpole with considerable formality, carrying the flag. The Indians who had been grouped and squatted about the pole began to withdraw to dis display some uneasiness. When the when the point in time came, Mr. Crawford believed that the sight of the large flag, they no doubt having been seen such waving at some of the forts or agencies, brought to them a suspicion that new restraints were about to be put upon them. Having learned to speak a dozen or so Indian words, he sought to explain about the significance and symbolism of the flag. And finally, after much effort and some grotesque performances and per attempted use of the sang <laughs> they became assured that no harm would come to them, and again gathered closely about the pole. When the attempt was made to raise the flag, the halyards refused to work, and the rope, being new, kinked in the wooden pulleys Mr. Crawford had made, and strenuous efforts only seemed to make things worse. The flag stood at less than half mass, it would go neither up nor down. Oh, the pine pole being peeled was so smooth that it was thought impossible to climb up and adjust the knot of rope. So, Old Yamanite was one of the best disposed of all the tribes of youth that roamed these parts. He was, in fact, an Indian of unusual good sense. He was a sub chief and at that time controlled all the youth in this part of the country. The old fellow stepped forward with, with great dignity, as was the Indian custom on occasions of note and said, Injun fix him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he called out his nephew, Paul Winta, a fine fellow about 15 years old, who cooned it up the sleek pole and removed the knots and kinks. So the flag was sent to the top, spreading to the breeze. 
to the great delight of all. Even the Indians, who, after having assisted in, in the ra raising, lost all their re restraint, gave man many demonstrations of joy. Mr. Crawford believes this affair had a very happy effect on the conduct of the youth, as for a long time after, they were unusually friendly. Of course, on this occasion, as on most all occasions, the squaws with their papooses trailed after Mrs. Crawford to the cabin, where they always expected biscuit and sugar, <laughs> the two luxuries ever present in the minds of the Indians when around the habitations of the whites. The bright new flag looked so good waving in the air that the Crawfords let it float almost continuously until it was badly worn. It was a great delight to the roving prospector, trapper, or home seeker, and many were the joyous shouts away up and down the trails as these travelers would sight the flag. This flag, the first specimen of old glory to wave in Steamboat Springs, is still a treasured possession of the family and may be seen this very day, and most days hanging from a third story window of the Crawford home. Well, unfortunately, it's no longer a treasured possession of the family. Uh, it's, it's lost to us. We do have a picture of the flag, though. This is a picture of the flag, oh, probably on, in a Fourth of July celebration. And you can see it's, it's a very tattered flag. I'll pass this around. But we do have something from that first Fourth of July celebration. Uh, this is the, the, steam, the museum has this. It's a wooden mallet that was made from the, the flagpole. So uh, Jimmy made this mallet years later when he was uh, the president of the uh, the Route Moffat Pioneer Association. <coughs> so, uh, and we do have one other flag, which I'll show here. Now this flag, it it's, has a lot more stars than the one in the picture there. This flag was uh, used to drape uh, Jimmy's coffin when he finally died in 1930. Uh, the coffin was draped with, with the flag and put in the parlor of the Crawford House. And hundreds of people came to pay their last respects to the, the founder. You know, I, I do have a, a picture of the, the coffin line there in the, the parlor. Pass that around. So that's the end of my talk. Is there any questions? Yeah. I had two questions. One was quick. Um, was there no homesteading, or did he buy the land from the federal government? Or what was the, the home. Uh, there were a couple of Homestead Acts. Uh, he bought it, I think, from the Homestead Act of 1832 or something like that. It said that if if you lived on the land for five years, uh, you could could homestead up to 160 acres. But at the end of the five years, in order to gain ownership, you had to pay a dollar and a quarter per acre. Now that five-year residency requirement was reduced by one year for every year of service in the the, the military. So for uh, Jimmy, he served three years in the Civil War. So he only had to live on the land for two years before he got title to the land. But he had to have it surveyed and then he paid the dollars. You still need the survey and uh, paid the money. So he, the, the, his title, uh, which I don't have, there's a copy of the title up in the, the federal record. His title was granted well, actually, there's a copy of the, all the titles in the, the courthouse here. Uh, and you'll see there's the five people that went in with him, you know, the four people and himself, all took title uh, at, at a similar time. But those other people, their dates were two and three years after his date. They're recorded at the same time. They all went through the same paperwork. They applied for it at the same time. But he didn't have to wait as long. So did they all go together to get the 160 acres? Or each one. Each one was 160 acres. His 160 oh. acres included, basically it was it's Lincoln Avenue above 9th Street, all the way up to Dream Island. So it includes, you know, Western uh, Steamboat, the library, the, all the springs. It included the far side of the river, uh, the Sulphur Cave, uh, the depot <coughs> area. And then it included on up to it wasn't a rectangle, it was a, a, a T-shape. It included the area where the, the college is. And then later, he 
five years later, or actually in the, the mid 80s, 86, he took out another homestead claim. And that claim was sort of the old, uh, the, the Crawford edition, or the second edition of, of, uh, of Steamboat. That includes everything north of Crawford Avenue. It includes all of uh, all the streets that run north, south, east, west, rather than Fairwood or Lincoln Avenue. So, you know, uh, was it Logan Street, Missouri Street, Park Street, all those were in, in his second 160 acre. Uh, and the other question was, when did Steamboat get its name? Was it already named by the time he was? The actual spring was already na named Steamboat Spring. That's, he, he couldn't claim credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> he wished he could, but uh, anyway, and he, he gave a, an interview with a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And in that interview, he was asked that question, and, and he said he, he didn't know, he, he couldn't claim credit, but uh, it was obvious, because at that time, it really did chuck. Uh, it, it pulled, sort of spouted four or five feet high every couple of seconds, and that spouting gave a chug, chug, chug sound. Uh, Did the Indians have a name for the spring before we came? You know, if they did, I'm not sure what, sure about that. You know, they called, the Indians called it, it was called the Bear River rather than the Yampa River back then. Uh, How long before they moved into the real house? It was a couple of weeks. No, I mean the stone house. Oh, the, the stone house? Oh, they lived in the cabin for 10 years. Oh, okay. Uh, until 1886. At that time, they moved up, well, by that time, they had the, the Sutter sawmill here. So instead of having log cabins, you could make frame houses. So they built a frame house, which it still exists now. It's if you look at the extension of Crawford Avenue on the far side of uh, 12th Street, there's a little. It's a blue house right now. And that was their frame house. It's been much enlarged. You, there's only there's a bay window there that you can recognize. It. Uh, but anyway, they lived there for. They moved in there in 1886, and they lived there for 10 years. While they lived there, they built the stone house. And then they moved into the stone house around, they started building it in 1893. They probably moved in in 95 or six. And they lived in that till he died. He died in the house, she died in the house in 39. Uh, house remained with the Crawfords until 51. Uh, then they sold it, lived, four different families uh, lived in it. And then we were finally able to buy it back in 2004. Where did the, the stone part of the stone house come from? Where did they pour that? Yeah, they started pouring from, uh, if you look at Lincoln Avenue as it's going by the college, there's a lot of rock on the right hand side there. And they first started pouring, taking the stone from that area. You know, it's just a quarter mile from the stone house. Uh, but it, that stone was too soft. And so then they, they went to the quarry that's up on you know, Blackmere Drive. Now, as far as I know, that they were the that was the first use of that uh, stone from from the quarry up there, and you know you can see that quarry from the house. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you, you could watch the wagon bring the stone down. Um, I was wondering who the uh, historian in the family was who was possessed on um, saving all this memorabilia that you have. <laughs> we're pack rats. <laughs> uh, first of all. The, the Pritchett. Uh, Lily Pritchett was the oldest daughter, and she ended up marrying uh, Pritchett and living in, in Denver. And they had two daughters, Margaret and Lolita. Lolita was the author who wrote all the books here. And they lived in that the same house there until she died in, I forget, 92, I think it was, 1992. And when she died, uh, you know, my sisters and I, uh, my brother, inherited the house, and my sister Nancy decided she wanted to live in the house. So she's now currently living there, and it, it, it looked just like it had looked 100 years before. It, it had all the, the Pritchett things in it. Uh, when they, the, when the Carpets finally sold the stone house, they moved many of the things from there down to the Pritchett house. So, you know, in the closets, in the attic, she kept finding yeah. things. <laughs> uh, so that was one source. But the other source was 
our grandfather, uh, John Crawford, lived on Crawford Avenue, about half a block from the Stone House. And uh, my father was born and raised there. Uh, he owned that house until the 60s and 70s. So sort of the, the John Crawford part of, of James Hartford Crawford's estate was in that house. And so finally in, in the, the 60s, my father came up and loaded up uh, trunks of things and brought them to our house. And so we had three or four trunks of old letters and photographs. And they just stayed in our attic. Nobody opened them up until finally I got them and opened them and found these letters. Wow. You know, all these letters by some James Harvey Crawford were in one of those trunks. They had no idea about us until the 1990s. And then all of a sudden, there they were. Do you want to mention yeah, Luli's sure. diary and what that's done for our historical record? Sure. Uh, uh, you know, Luli was the oldest daughter, uh, had a diary, I think it was 1881. She, uh, she, she maintained the diary for a year or two. And so, it, actually, I think it's going on here, but uh, Lolita wrote a book about the diary, included the transcription of the diary and various facts about that. Then it was just cabins. Uh, for the first four years, from 76 to 80, the Crawford family was the only permanent residence in the Yucca Valley here. Uh, there were other cabins, you know, the, the article here mentioned the Farleys and the Harrisons, but they, they only lived here for a year or two. There were a bunch of other people that came by, came for a year or two. There was a, a couple that lived at Hans Peak that came down and lived with the Crawfords for a couple winters, uh, but their kids had already moved on. And so the Crawfords, Crawford kids were the only kids in this valley for about five years. And Margaret was, I mean, there were occasionally other women, but she said later in life that one of the hardest parts for her during those years was she had nobody to talk to. She had no other women to talk to for four or five years. And that was, you know, she had her kids and that was it. Um, I'd be interested to hear you talk about your personal discovery or learning about your family's history and how that has influenced your life. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, be, be, before I opened up that trunk and started read, reading through the letters, I was sort of mildly curious. Well, I should say, growing up, I had no interest at all about the, the older generation. <clears throat> My father died in 1975, and I really regret the fact that I never really talked to him about Steamboat and about his life here. I just didn't interest me. He died finally. I finally I started talking to, started writing letters with Lolita Pritchett. Uh, you know, she was the author. She'd written some of her books already. And I started asking her questions. You know, what was my grandfather like? My grandfather, grandparents had died before I was uh, born. So I asked her, you know, what were they like? So she finally started writing, uh, writing pamphlets, basically, or booklets, uh, just for us kids. I mean, I think that's it. Every Christmas time, she would write more stories. One year it was about my grandfather, another year it was about Uncle Logan, another year about Lily. Uh, and so each year she built, she wrote these booklets. And those booklets eventually ended up being published. Uh, this one, Remem Remember the Old Yampa Valley, uh, was one of them. It was about Logan. Uh, so anyway, you know, that sort of slowly piqued my interest in uh, in the history here. But still, it was basically just writing letters to her and uh, getting her to write these booklets. Finally, she died. Again, I regret not talking to her more. But she died, and I finally started opening up this trunk of, of books. And once I opened that up and started reading these letters, I, I found that James Harvey Crawford love letters in the Civil War uh, right near the beginning. And that just really piqued my interest. Now, I, I had to go through the whole trunk just to find all the letters. You know, they weren't all in one place. They were scattered throughout. So I went through the trunk and I became more and more interested. And uh, over that, since that time, I've written a couple of books myself, uh, including the, the Crawford House. You know, it was wonderful to be able to buy back the Crawford House. That really opened my, my eyes up to, uh, to what
what their life was like back in, in those days. So it's, it's changed my world a lot uh, uh, once I started reading those letters. Was, uh, in those first four years, was cattle his livelihood? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and he, did he fence off the 160 or did he open ranch? No, he, he, all, he opened ranch. Okay. And they never wintered the cattle here. They always wintered the cattle. You know, the first two years at Kremlin. Then once they moved here, they wintered them, uh, I think it's called Burns Hole, which is, you know, if you go, if you head down the uh, State Bridge, it's one of the near State Bridge, it's one of the tributaries that flow into the Grand, uh, to the Colorado River near there. It's sort of a, a mild, it was a very heavy winter. And he got word, uh, he had his brother, I think, was taking care of the cattle. He got word that they were dying and it was starvation. So he actually, he was living in Boulder at the time. You know, he spent the winter in Boulder. So he took a trip here and he took a, he kept a diary of his, of that trip. So he came back, uh, found that the, you know, every day they found a few more cattle that were, had died. Uh, it was, it's a very sad story. That diary was eventually published by Lolita in, I think, the Colorado Magazine, which is a, a state historical publication. So, uh, anyway, three or four years after that, I think it was in 86 or 85, he had a, a cattle drive, took all of his cattle up the Blue River to Leadville. And, you know, Leadville was blooming then, had lots of <coughs> miners. And he sold his, all of his cattle at you know, a great profit. He did keep horses though. He kept a herd of 50 to 100 horses. He sold his cattle off, he kept his horses. And uh, those horses he maintained for another uh, five to 10 years. And the horses he finally sold off to buy the, to build the stone house. And in fact, he used the horses as money to pay the, the stone mason. The contract says, you know, these horses are, you can use these horses to haul the stone to the house. Uh, there, and when you're finished with the stone, the horses belong to you. So <laughs> that was it. When they, when he first moved his family from uh, Hot Sulphur Springs here, how did he get here? Over Rabbit Ears or no, or over no. Gore Pass. Gore Pass? Uh, Gore Pass had sort of had a road because Gore the you know. The, that it was named at, had come on a hunting trip, I forget, back in the 50s, I think, or much earlier. And that old road was, still existed as a trail. So it, it was an easy trail from there over to, you know, to Pinus and Yampa, you know, that area. From there, the trail sort of ended up going over 20 Mile Park. Uh, <coughs> down river, down the Yampa River was very hard and they, they had no, there was no trail at the moment. So that's why every time he came, he had to do a little more work on the trail. Uh, people it ended up going that way clear until the turn of the century, I think, before people started going over Rabbit Ears. And the Rabbit Ears Road, I think, was, that was in the 20s or 30s. As someone who was born and raised in Seabird, I just want to thank you and your family for coming back and doing yeah. my house and, and sharing it with all of it, it was such a delight to hear that you were back, and then when you started the remodel, and, and we were all so curious about it, and then you actually opened it up and let us come in. And, uh, it means so much, so thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome. I'm very happy to be here. Well, maybe we should end on that note. <laughs>